Welcome everyone to the fourth webinar in our Live from the Lab series. Uh, previously, you've heard from some of our elite researchers, Alex Sette, Shane Crade, uh, Erica Sapphire, and Daniela Weisskopf. And they heard about their critical work and now internationally recognized work in understanding the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Today, you'll hear from our president and chief scientific officer, Mitch Cronenberg, who will give you an update on the progress of the Institute's overall progress in addressing the COVID-19 pandemic and the operations here at the Institute. Uh, Dr. Daniela Weisskopf will also be joining us from the lab uh, later in the program to specifically talk about some of her groundbreaking research. We'll then close with the opportunity for all of you to ask questions of Mitch, Daniela, and I. So before we start the presentation, I wanted to share with you a brief 30 second commercial that you may have seen running on stations in San Diego over the last couple of weeks. You'll recognize some of the faces of those researchers you've heard from in this series previously, those who have worked heroically and tirelessly since the beginning of this pandemic. And so to get us started, let's take a look at the spot. COVID-19 is relentless. It is advancing, but so are we. We stay late, come in early, and become even more obsessed. We know the answer lies within our own bodies. We've harnessed the power of the immune system before and we'll do it again. We're immunologists. Join us in our fight against COVID-19 here at La Jolla Institute for Immunology. All right, well with that, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Mitchell Cronenberg, uh, Mitch, uh, got his uh, bachelor's from Columbia, his PhD from Caltech. His research interests are broad, uh, but he's very well known for studying innate like T cells, uh, antimicrobial responses, mucosal immunology, and diseases like inflammatory bowel disease and Crohn's. He's got a uh, illustrious career. Um, Starting uh, in 1974, he, he was a postdoctoral fellow with Lee, with Lee Hood at Caltech and moved over to be a professor at UCLA and was there until he joined the Institute in 1997. In 2003, he became president of the La Jolla Institute and is the president and chief scientific officer today. He's also the Dean of Immunology at UC San Diego and has been awarded numerous uh, awards. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorites to point out is uh, his award from the American Association of Immunologists as a distinguished fellow. And uh, this award is especially appropriate for Mitch as he has been uh, a mentor for many at the Institute and throughout the scientific community. Uh, rather than uh, go through uh, the various areas of research excellence, um, I would just like everyone to know that in addition to being president and chief scientific officer, Mitch remains a very active uh, research investigator and is among the Institute's most highly cited uh, principal investigators. So without further ado, I give you Mitch Cronenberg. Okay, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate everyone coming to hear about our COVID-19 research. I'd like to start just by giving you a little background uh, on the La Jolla Institute. We were founded in 1988, and we have about 500 employees, 21 independent labs, and many uh, wonderful postdoctoral fellows from around the world. Um, and we have a budget which has been climbing upwards into the $70 million range. And uh, the great majority of it comes from federal grants and contracts. Uh, although we depend on other sources, uh, including um, corporate sources and... Um, so what is our, sorry, what is our mission? The, the Institute will engage in a world-class biomedical research program with a focus on the immune system. It will conduct, share, and partner such that the results of our discovery program 
will make outstanding contributions to the benefit of human health. Next slide, please. So we have a very clear and powerful focus. We study immunology because we know that's the area where we can have the greatest impact for affecting human health. And the immune system affects many kinds of diseases, um, including allergy and asthma, autoimmune diseases, cancer, the immune response to cancer is very important. And of course, infectious uh, diseases and vaccine discovery. Next slide, please. So we are um, highly rated or highly ranked in our field or in the world based on our research performance, um, our patents and uh, related activities for commercialization, and of course our societal impact, including um, the internet traffic and other kinds of traffic that we attract based on our research findings. Next, please. We've all had enough pandemic, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure of that. So where are we now? Well, 189,000 deaths and more than 6 million cases in the United States. And many more around the world. And there's some dispute about these numbers. Are they over or under? They're fairly accurate. And if we look at the daily um, case load, you can see that it's, it's, gone, uh, it's been higher and it's declining slowly. But we can't be guaranteed that it will continue to decline. How do we put this in context? Next, please. The Vietnam War, 58,000 deaths. Okay. Now, in the United States, there are many more than 189,000 deaths. But um, still, that's an enormous loss of life. That's, a tra that's tragic. So who's dying from the coronavirus? It's deadly if you are old and you're male. And it's quite amazing, but despite all the years of study, we, we don't have a very deep understanding of the difference in immune responses between men and women. This is an area that requires further investigation. Next, please. So here's a, a chart that shows you the, uh, the case uh, infection fatality rate in men and women, and uh, men are in orange. And you can see if you're over 70, it goes up dramatically, 5%, 10% even, and more in men than women. This is a Spanish study, but it reflects what we see elsewhere. Next, please. This is San Diego. Most of the cases you can see are between 20-year-olds and 60-year-olds. Next, please. But most of the deaths you can see at the bottom, there are, as of earlier this week, there were 709 deaths in San Diego County, and most of them are in people over 60 years old. So this is a little different in the sense that as many of you know, the young are fairly protected from, from vulnerability here. Next, please. So how do we get to normalcy? Where's the light at the end of the tunnel? And next, please. We're all hoping <laughs> or praying for immunity. Next. So the only way out is herd immunity, meaning that many of us are resistant because of vaccination or exposure. And if you look at the chart, you, if we imagine that there are a few people who are, uh, who are sick and contagious, they're in red, and no one's immunized, the virus can spread. That's in the top row. But if you look in the bottom row, if many people are immunized, they're in the, in the yellow color, then the few people who are sick and potentially contagious, it cannot spread. Of course, that's very idealized, and many infected people are not symptomatic at all, but they may also, they may be asymptomatic, and they may also be protected or not very contagious, or the opposite. It's not really certain that all asymptomatic people, in fact, it's, we can be reasonably certain that there are asymptomatic people who can, who can probably spread the disease. Next, please. So we're very far from herd immunity by exposure, maybe a few percent of the population. So vaccines are critical. There are 33 vaccine candidate trials. And as you can see on the right, there are six that, um, that are at phase three, the most advanced phase of trial. And the other numbers indicate different targets of vaccines that I'll explain briefly. Next, please. 
<clears throat> in order to understand vaccines, we have to think of something called immunologic memory. Immunologic memory or immune memory is the basis of all vaccination. Immune memory allows your body to respond faster and stronger to an infection after an earlier exposure. You might think of it almost as a, as a workout for your immune system to make it ready. So immune memory to a virus, for example, is generated by exposing your body to an activated virus or parts of the virus so that your immune system says, aha, I've seen this before when confronted with the real infectious pathogen. Next. So how do vaccines work to stimulate immunity by giving you parts of viruses? Well, some may have spike protein. So that's one important protein on the outside of the virus that gives us its crown or corona. Uh, other vaccines might be pieces of genetic material from the virus, DNA and RNA, as opposed to a purified protein. Uh, another strategy would be to use a killed virus or virus. And a third strategy on the right uh, would be to take a less harmful or harmless virus and genetically engineer it to express a viral protein. And, the, and below that, you can see different companies, some of the different companies that are uh, pursuing these strategies. So vaccines will be tested in rigorous clinical trials, which um, go through different phases. And the phase three, the sixth there in phase three, uh, are trying to enroll approximately 30,000 people each. It takes that many to be certain that the virus is, is effective as well as safe, because some of the safety comes from, of course, the earlier phases, phase one and two. Next, please. So how effective are vaccines? This is a chart. It shows you different years. And the, the more orange or green, the uh, more orange the color in particular, the more cases. Vaccine is introduced around uh, mid-1960s against measles. And you can see the, the, the chart goes to white and gray, which means fewer cases. And in fact, um, many, many fewer cases. Next, please. And what you can see is that many, many fewer cases means that the measles vaccine has saved an estimated 14 million lives since 2011. Vaccines are very, very effective. Next. Okay, so with all this effort, all uh, 33 uh, um, vaccine efforts, big companies involved, uh, what can a medium-sized institution like La Jolla Institute contribute? And the thing that's very clear is that the first vaccine will not be the last one or the best one. They'll require about a 50% efficacy. And that doesn't mean that you're completely cured either. It could mean reduced system symptoms, 50% efficacy to be improved. We need to understand why some people get very sick and others are asymptomatic. We, we need to understand why the old are different from the young or why men are different from women. We need to understand what type of immune response is protective and what types are actually harmful. And we need to know, of course, how long immunity will last. And next, please. Also, we need treatments. So vaccines will eventually get us to herd immunity, but we need treatments because some people cannot be vaccinated. They're old or they're very young. The vaccines will not always work. They will not protect everyone. And finally, some people will not be vaccinated. And there are estimates that 40% of the American public uh, will not take a uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Next. So we have great skill at our institute. And we have investigators who, who understand immunologic memory, uh, antiviral responses, who built great toolkits for understanding immunology. And they have come together to form what we're calling a coronavirus task force. We didn't uh, direct this from the top, self-organized. And these investigators are shown here. And we're going to tell you about some of their work. Next, please. So the, in keep putting this into context, your immune system is a complicated entity. And if you think about a virus on the left entering a cell, every cell that gets infected with a virus sends out a signal. And that signal activates something called the innate immune response. These are the Marines, if you will, of the immune system. 
and they, they can respond quickly and vigorously. They, they understand if it's a virus or not. They might, they, it doesn't really respond to a particular type of virus or a bacteria uh, as well. They can, the innate response can see bacteria generally. But what we need for sterilizing immunity is the adaptive immune response with its B cells and T cells. Next, please. So I'm gonna hand it over to Daniela Weisskopf, uh, who uh, works in Alex Sete's lab and has been really one of the leaders in helping us to understand adaptive immunity to COVID-19. She's in the lab safely uh, uh, garbed and wearing her mask. Daniela. Hello, everybody. Welcome, um, live from the lab. Um, I'm talking to you out of the lab where we have been working every day since uh, February when the first case of the virus uh, was uh, spread in the United States. And uh, what we are interested in is uh, the three arms of the adaptive immune response, which is basically what you can see here on the slide. Uh, it consists of antibodies um, and then two flavors of T cells. One is the so-called helper T cells, which as you can see by the name, is supposed to help you make better antibodies and uh, create a good response against the, the virus, in this case, the virus. And then we also study um, so-called killer T cells, which also, as you can indicate by the name, are supposed to like kill virus infected cells and help you clear the body. So these are the three different arms of the immune system that we are interested in. And why are we um, specifically interested in this? Because a hallmark of these three arms is that they can form immune memory and Mitch has briefly mentioned um, what that is and what we understand. That means your immune system can remember if it has already seen um, parts of the virus or that also works for any other bacteria. So these are the three um, um, immune cells and immune types that we are interested in. And if you go to the next slide, please, you can see um, that I work very closely with two members of the task force. Uh, one is Shane Crady and one is Alexander Sette in whose lab I'm working. And I've been working closely with uh, Alvaro Grifoni, who's an instructor in our um, lab. And we have been interested in, as a very first uh, instance, to define the immune response in, um, in average cases of COVID. And why is that important? Because this is the majority of people. The majority of people will um, be infected with the virus, do not have most severe cases, and uh, also not average. So they're um, the, uh, also not asymptomatic. The average case is uh, someone that's infected, has symptoms, but uh, then can clear the virus. The other reason why we wanted to study um, this in the convalescent phase, meaning once these people have been recovered, is because that reflects a successful immune response. Because if you have been infected with the virus and you um, survive, this is by definition a successful recovery. So we wanted to know what is the immune response in patients that have been infected with the virus and successfully recovered. And we did look into all of the three arms of the immune system I was just like uh, uh, mentioning to you. And uh, we had uh, very uh, good results, meaning we could show that in convalescent phase, like 100% of the patients that successfully recover had an immune response um, against um, uh, the virus. 100% had helper cells and about 70% had the killer cells. And all of them made really good antibodies. And these antibodies were actually working in concert with the helper cells. So all of these signs of the successful good immune response. Another thing that we, um, we could show in this uh, um, study was that a vaccine, the, the protein that is contained in many, many vaccines, the spike protein, which is the spiky part that you can see in the graphs, is actually highly recognized. Almost everybody recognizes this protein. And that's important because you wanna um, have a vaccine that induces parts that uh, are also recognized by natural infection. So that was very good news um, when we looked into the very first study out of this um, lab. And um, we were actually even uh, more excited when you, as you can see on the next slide, this was not only uh, considered by us very good news, but this was also considered uh, by uh, Tony Fauci good news as he showed our, uh, this exact paper we have been looking at. 
to Congress in the congressional hearing. So we are excited uh, to know that uh, not only us are interested in TSOs, but now also Congress knows about us. So this actually inspired some of us uh, to uh, retire, but um, as you will hear later, we have lots more work to do and uh, need to keep going. And um, on the next slide, I can now give you an overview of what we have been going forward after we have successfully described um, a good immune response. And this is a phenomenon that we recognized early on. Um, when you make a good experiment, uh, you always need to make sure that you have the appropriate controls, meaning like you compare people that have been exposed to the virus with people that have never seen the virus so you can see what is actually a true um, immune response above background in your experimental setup. So we did that, and for that, we use patients that have been uh, recruited, their blood have been recruited um, years before the virus was even like circulating. And uh, in these donors that we have been um, uh, seen in 2015 and 2018, we surprisingly saw that about half of them did have helper cells that recognized um, this virus. That was surprising. And, uh, and uh, we were wondering, what is it that is recognized? And not only us have seen that, by, by now there's multiple groups around the globe that actually have seen this exact same phenomenon in control donors that we know have never seen the virus. They have helper cells that recognize this virus. So we had a hypothesis based on uh, one thing that Mitch has explained to you, um, the immune memory. So if, what if these people have not seen this virus, which we knew they have not seen it, but what if they have seen a virus that is similar enough to actually induce cross-reactive memory? And um, there is um, a bunch of coronaviruses that are actually widely circulating around the globe, around the populations, which are so-called human coronaviruses, human common coronaviruses. And they are the so to say, good cousin of the SARS-CoV-2 because they are inducing uh, some sort of disease. You get the sniffles, you do get sick, but it's not very um, severely, um, it's not inducing a very severe disease. And they are closely related to SARS-CoV-2. So that was the hypothesis. Is this immune response that we see in donors that have never seen SARS-CoV-2, is that induced by um, common cold coronaviruses? So we went on and to study just that. And again, we went back to donors where we knew they have not seen this virus and tested them against um, parts from, the, from these human common cold coronaviruses. And we can show, as you see on the right graph here, that uh, the T cell response um, against uh, these SARS-CoV-2 peptides and also the other common coronaviruses just equally well recognized uh, this virus. So that was our um, hint that this is really the viruses that have been inducing the memory against SARS-CoV-2, which is uh, something that is um, um, interesting because that is confirming the hypothesis where this response is coming from. So this is something that is uh, under um, a lot of investigation right now. And uh, we are, because right now we want to find out, so what does it mean? So we have seen the response, we have mapped it to human coronaviruses, common cold coronaviruses, but we do not know yet if this is good for you, bad for you, or it does not matter at all. So and this is something that our lab is actively working on right now. And with this, I give it back to Mitch um, on the next slide, because I have been showing you um, how a successful immune response looks like um, against coronavirus, but certainly there's people that do not are able to amount a successful response and, uh, and Mitch is going to uh, touch base on that. Thank you, Daniela. So um, the important point to make is that those who get very sick seem to have unbalanced immunity rather than a lack of immunity in the aged population. It's almost as if you were rowing a boat with one oar. You'll go in a circle rather than forward. So it's not the absence. It's the lack of balance. Next, please. Yes, too much innate immunity. Next. So um, it seems that there's the wrong types of immunity in the severely ill. So those who do well in the green have uh, high antibodies and uh, a cellular medi mediated or T cell response. And those who don't do well 
have a skewed response, too much of one type of immunity or another, and particularly an overactive innate immune response. Next, please. So we have labs that are looking into this. Sonia Sharma's lab is measuring in the blood inflammatory biomarkers in severe COVID-19 patients, cytokines, acute phase proteins, other things that, are, that get made under cellular stress and when there's chronic uh, inflammation, and also metabolites, small molecules that might also have a similar effect. Next, please. Also looking at aspects of innate immunity is Lynn Hedrick's lab. And one type of cell she's studying is called a monocyte. And some of these cells uh, are, are protective. And there's a decrease, as you can see, in the severe cases in red on the right compared to the mild cases. So we have evidence already that um, there's too much of certain kinds of immunity, particularly innate immunity. Next, please. So the immune system has checks and balances, um, the way our government was designed. And so uh, there are parts of the immune system that actually help to slow it down. And one of them are the so-called regulatory T cells. So Vijay's lab is looking at patients who have mild disease and patients who have severe disease uh, and have been uh, hospitalized uh, and patients in the kind of an intermediate range. And he's been using single cell techniques to analyze uh, individual T cells from these patients for their reactivity uh, and also for the type of functions they have. And next, please, just one little snapshot is what he's found is that the hospitalized patients have fewer of these regulatory T cells. These are breaks on the immune system and their breaks in this in generally are not working in the more severe hospitalized cases. So again, evidence that unbalanced immunity is critical. Next, please. So vaccines are, are very, very important, but we need treatments. And probably the most uh, important treatment is uh, antibodies. You may have heard of plasma therapy. So in plasma, there are literally billions of different kinds of antibodies. And uh, the effectiveness of plasma is highly uncertain. As you can see in this diagram, these little green colored Ys are specific antibodies that bind to the crown, if you will, uh, of the coronavirus that bind to the spike protein. And by doing that, they block the ability of the virus to get into uh, human cells. Next, please. But we don't want to use plasma. We want to use highly selected, highly engineered antibodies, the best antibodies that we can manufacture and uh, produce in scale and then provide as a potential therapy for patients. Next, please. So Erica Ullman Sapphire, who you may have heard in some of the earlier uh, sessions of this series, has started the Coronavirus Immunotherapy Consortium, or COVIC, uh, to find the best therapeutic antibodies to, to assess them in standardized side-by-side -side assays. So what she has done um, is gathered, uh, organized, uh, biotech companies, pharmaceutical companies, and they're all pooling or sharing their individual selected antibodies that will be tested for their ability to bind to the spike protein or other proteins, carry out neutralization antibodies, and a variety of uh, neutralization tests, sorry, and a variety of tests to understand who's, which antibodies are most effective. Next. And this effort is, um, was ignited by private philanthropy, FAST grants, Bill and Melinda Gates, GHR Foundation, and more recently uh, by the National Institutes of Health and uh, Operation Warp Speed. Um, so in effect, the, the antibodies that will be chosen for therapy will be vetted through La Jolla Institute for Immunology and our collaborators. Next, please. One of the things that we've done is invested in uh, the Titan Krios elect cryoelectron microscope, which allows us to visualize the spike protein, the side view and top view, as you can see here. The important part of this is to understand where the therapeutic antibodies are binding. Where are the targets for the antibodies that will give us the most effective neutralization? Next, please. 
So what is COVID doing today? We have 200 antibodies from around the world that are being evaluated at La Jolla Institute and elsewhere. Uh, trials are now enrolling. And you can see on the bottom right all these vials. And potentially, there's a life-saving treatment in one or more of those vials. Next, please. We also have animal models to study how the immune response controls the infection or contributes to the disease, and which will allow us to test therapeutic antibodies as part of COVID. There are things we can do in animal models which have their limitations, but there are things we can do, such as deliberate infections, uh, which allow us to make rapid progress. And this effort is being led by Sujin Shrestha's lab. And what you can see on the right is one of our investigators working in our newly certified biosafety level three containment facility. One, um, one handles uh, SARS-CoV-2 only in, in a special facility, and you can see the uh, respirator and the gown worn by this individual. A little more stringent, but uh, Daniela is, uh, has to wear working with pieces of the virus. Next, please. So really, the question I want to leave you with is uh, not only how do we get over this pandemic uh, through treatments and through herd immunity, uh, but are we ready for the next pandemic? There will be others, certainly. And the, the power of the La Jolla Institute, uh, and I hope I've convinced you that despite uh, not having the research budget of a Pfizer that, or a similar organization that we've made an impact, a big impact. The power is studying the immune system from different perspectives. Next, please. So obviously we have infectious disease and vaccines, next. But we also study cancer and the immune response to cancer. And next, please. And we study autoimmunity and inflammation. And findings in any one of these areas can have major impacts on the others. Because fundamentally, what we need to understand is how the immune system varies in people of different ages, different genders, how it discriminates between what is safe and what is dangerous, and how it prevents itself from becoming unregulated. Next, please. So I'd like to hand it over or back, if you will, to Steve Wilson. He's our exec executive vice president and chief operating officer, a very, very important person in this organization who's worked, uh, worked with me for many years in helping to manage our research effort. Steve? Thanks, Mitch. So as I get started, um, let's go to the next slide. And all of you have, have joined us today and, and our focus on COVID-19 is appropriate. But as we think about the La Jolla Institute and its mission, uh, it's important to remember that the work that the work and the facilities and uh, the results that we find in COVID-19 have a cross effect in other areas. Mitch mentioned it a bit, but very simply put, the same immune system that will protect you against cancer, that will attack you in autoimmune disease, or that will respond to a vaccine and protect you from COVID-19 one day, this is the same immune system. And the same immune system, when, it's, when we understand it and we're able to exploit the power of it, helps all of these areas at once. Next slide. Similarly, the support that we get through the community helps all these areas. And so right now, while we're focused on COVID-19 and the research that's going to help get us through this and prepare us for the next uh, pandemic, uh, those same giving opportunities have knock-on effects for other areas. And so I would imagine that many of us right now are thinking about infectious disease and vaccines a lot. But prior to this, our concerns may have been in other areas, in other autoimmune diseases or cancer and the like. And so I'd just like to um, uh, remind everyone that the Institute um, is a is a charity. It's a 501c3 nonprofit, and we're here for public benefit. And so uh, if we can animate the slide, uh, there are a couple of things that I would just like to uh, put out there. Uh, chief among my responsibilities is to facilitate the research in all of the labs. 
Uh, one of those uh, immediate priorities is for us to be able to study proteins at a very large and massive scale. And an instrument that gets us there is a mass spectrometer. Uh, we've already um, received about $1 million in, in promised gifts. And if we can patch up the, the remaining costs, another 700,000, we'll purchase this instrument, put it to work in COVID-19 and, and otherwise. Next. Uh, our clinical core is, for a research institute, a bit unique. What our clinical core is, is this is the interface between hospitals and points of care and the researchers here at the institute. They're nurses, they're phlebotomists, and we have an opportunity to expand the core, take in more people uh, who are both suffering from COVID-19 and other diseases, but also to evaluate vaccines and therapeutics and we need some help in building that out quickly. Next. And then finally, we got a shot of the BSL-3. It's a unique facility, and one of the things that makes it uh, particularly unique is that everything that goes in must stay in. The only thing that comes out are the people. And so we have to get equipment that would normally be distributed around the Institute, and it all has to go into the facility and stay in there locked up tight for biosafety reasons. We're nearly there and after some extensive investment, uh, we still have about $300,000 that we're looking to patch to finish up the facility. Next. And there's a picture of it. And then finally, um, we have a coronavirus task force, which you heard about. The task force itself is applying for and receiving grant funding, but there are a lot of high risk yet high reward projects that could be attempted with additional funds. In some ways, the advances we've made in such short time are a result of philanthropic gifts. So before the grant applications were out and before the opportunities were crystallized at the federal level where we get a lot of our support, it was philanthropic gifts that allowed us to take the chance and move forward. And I think some of the results are, are stunning. And so these are, these are funds that uh, cannot be understated. And for those of you who have supported the Institute, thank you very much for it. Next. All right, Mitch, I think that this is where uh, you get yep. to take over and lead us through. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm gonna start, Steve, with a question for you. And sure. it is, how confident should we be regarding the safety of a vaccine before a phase three study is complete or perhaps after it's complete? <laughs> All right, no, uh, well, thanks for the question. So first off, the clinical trials are that are that melding of science and medicine, where we take a promising composition and put it through trials. And as the name suggests, there, is, there are things to learn. And we should all look forward to the diligence and the investigation into these larger trials, phase three, because for the first time, we'll see how a large population of different humans reacts. Uh, it won't be a surprise to anyone if some things that are expected come to fruition, and we discover some things that were unexpected. This is, this is what makes it better. This is what is important. And so uh, while patience is in short supply, certainly uh, none of us here want to wait any longer than we have to. These phase three trials are the first large critical evaluation of these products before they get uh, put into an extraordinarily large population. And given the gravity of what vaccines do, and that is to protect healthy people in advance, having an eye on safety is, is only logical. And so I think a little bit of patience, critical evaluation, and time is going to serve all of us extremely well. So I, I, would, I would let that, that phase three trial uh, run its course before it moves out to have full confidence. And then lastly, let's think about the fact that there are many vaccines on the way, many will go through those same phase three. And in total, we'll all as a society get a very clear picture about how the vaccines work and to what extent. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Clearly there'll be <clears throat> failures, but there will be successes. That's right. Okay, the next question, Danielle, I'm gonna uh, send this to you. How close to herd immunity are we? And you already touched on this, but What's the relationship between uh, infection with common cold coronaviruses 
and possible protection from COVID-19? Right, yeah, thank you. That's a very good question and certainly a question that everybody wants to know the answer right now because that will, is something that will get us out of here once we achieve herd immunity. So um, you asked, the question was like, is the pre-existing immune memory from common cold viruses helping us to achieve herd immunity faster? And the answer is that we do not know. As I pointed out, um, we see there's cross-reactive immune response. We have shown it does come from uh, closely related common cold viruses, but we do not know yet um, if this has any role in infection with SARS-CoV-2, if it's helping you, hurting you, or it does not matter at all. And just let's hypothetically think about this. If it would have any role in protecting from you, then we also don't know what kind of role it would have, right? Is it just helping you get less severe disease? Is it helping you not get infected at all? Or, uh, or is it actually making your disease worse? So that's all questions. There's a lot of answers and that's why we need to keep doing what we're doing and uh, trying to um, find answers to these questions. You know, I'm, I'm confident that with the tools you, you have, you'll get closer to the answer very soon. I, I truly believe that. Next question uh, is for me, I guess. Why are steroids helpful to treat COVID-19 if they suppress the immune system? And the point I wanted to emphasize, uh, well, first of all, dexamethasone may be helpful. That's a, that's a, a steroid. But we're talking about very severely ill patients people who are uh, very sick uh, in the hospital. And one of the things that seems to be going on with these very ill people is a very pronounced, uh, in what we call inflammatory response. Certain kinds of molecules are being made <clears throat> that are important for acute wound healing or other responses, but when they're chronic, they're very, very harmful. So it's interesting. It turns out that if you're a highly obese, this also gives a kind of a chronic inflammatory response. There's a molecule called IL-6, for example, that goes up in these people. Body mass index over 40, let's say. And, and highly obese people are, are, are more susceptible to severe disease. So when we talk about suppressing the immune system, and there are literally dozens of immune suppressive treatments that are being tested or considered, we're talking about the very severely ill patients who've entered that state where, where they have the, the intense inflammation and lung damage. Okay, Steve, I have another one for you. And it's about, it's the following. It is recommended that people get the flu vaccine as soon as possible to avoid any interaction with the coronavirus vaccine when it becomes available. Do you have an opinion or recommendation on this? I have a strong opinion, actually. Uh, thanks for the question. I think um, the only thing we can be sure about with coronavirus is you don't want to be sick with other things at the same time. And in influenza infection and flu itself challenges your lungs. And getting a flu vaccine allows your immune system to safely practice for this year's seasonal flu and take one of the risk factors off the list. There's a, your immune system is very much capable of becoming immune to the seasonal flu in advance and ideally before uh, you're exposed to COVID-19. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you think about it, a respiratory virus like influenza is particularly going to make you more susceptible uh, with lung damage and so on to COVID-19. So terrific answer. Thank you, Steve. Okay, the next uh, is for you, Daniela. Ready for this one. How are your discoveries helping vaccine development? Um, so, so in general, it's always a good idea comparing what we learn from natural infection to vaccines, because how can you judge if a vaccine is good or bad if you do not know what natural infection, successful immune response looks like? In this very specific uh, part, is uh, something that we have been showing is that in natural infection, the spike protein is highly, highly recognized. And as we heard from Mitch, a lot of vaccine candidates have just this protein in their vaccine. So it would be really not good if uh, you make a vaccine containing the spike protein and your immune system is not capable of recognizing it. 
So in this case, we actually shown that this very protein that is in a vaccine is really, really highly recognized. So that's good news. We have shown in addition that there's other part of the virus highly recognized. So if we need to improve any of the vaccines, you can think of like, you know, adding other targets and we provide the baseline of what is recognized in natural infection. And I think in this way, this can form in, uh, vaccine design and also like give tools how to evaluate response against it. Thank you, Danielle. Very good. Okay, the next one is, uh, well, it gives us congratulations for our work. I'm grateful for that. But the question is, how much of the work that you're doing on SARS-CoV-2 can be extended to viruses generally? Or the question was a little more technical about envelope viruses. So some viruses have a shield of lipid or fat around them. Um, I think um, to a great extent, the tools that we have developed and are developing and the work can be extended to many other infections, not just not even just viral infections. So we have, for example, the, the SETE lab that Daniela Weisskopf works in is the world's expert in figuring out what piece of a virus or a bacteria is being recognized by the immune response. What does the natural immune response see? Uh, the BJ's lab, to provide another example, single cell technologies, because the immune system is so heterogeneous. To look in depth at the function of single cells as they respond to infection. All of these tools are very, very important. And in fact, they were being applied. Uh, another example would be the Crotty Lab in memory or the, you know, the, all the labs. I, I won't go through the list. But. These labs were working on other viruses and making progress on dengue and Zika and HIV and so on. And, um, and they've all pivoted, they've all turned to this emergency situation. But, but the, the, the data that we've generated, for example, uh, on how to make an HIV vaccine, and we're, we're not there yet, we're not very close, but we're getting closer based on work from Shane Crotty's lab, for example, is, is helping. Uh, and is moving us forward. So I think these, these platform technologies and these skill sets we've developed uh, are, are going to help enormously. Now, on the other side, uh, every virus is different. Uh, I didn't anticipate that six months or eight, seven months after the first infections that we'd be looking to the end of the year and still probably being under highly restricted behavior. Um, this virus has presented us with complications, the age distribution, the other organs that are targeted, the kidney, the brain. Why do people lose their sense of smell and taste? Each infection brings its own uh, complications. Luckily with this one, um, it's not highly lethal. It is lethal. The case fatality rate may be 0.5% overall. But luckily, it's not two or three times that, or it's not two or three times more contagious. There's something called the r naught that measures contagion. So we're coping with it, with difficulty. I believe that what we have and others, what we've developed is we're learning so quickly that some of what we learn will not be uh, SARS-CoV-2 specific and will help us with other viruses. Thank you. Okay, here's one for Steve. Are there any organizations working on a relatively fast, simple, and inexpensive T-cell test? Sure. So, <clears throat> uh, so thanks for the question. I think the, the person asking is comparing it to the tests that we hear about typically, right? So one test would be a molecular assay to see if you have the virus. Another would be a serologic test to see if you have antibodies in your blood to protect you. A test to see if you have T-cells could be quite handy. And the work that Danielle is doing could inform how that test is constructed and how to interpret the results. The challenge is that unlike an antibody test, which many people could use the same test because it binds, the antibodies bind the surface of, of a target, a T cell assay may be something that has to be limited to a certain population. Our T cells are different. They, they actually work with a cell to see what's inside of it. And so T cells have this specificity and each person is different in this specificity and therefore the tests are, are tough. That being said, 
as T cells are becoming a prominent predictor of how you respond and potentially a, a predictor of how you, you're going to uh, fare with COVID-19, there are companies working on it, but I'm afraid a fast, simple, and inexpensive T cell assay, to my knowledge, is not yet out there. Yes, I agree. Well, well said. Okay, Daniela, is there a chance that the COVID-19 vaccine, when it's approved, will also immunize against the common cold, or at least lead to a vaccine for the common cold as well? Look at the reverse, what uh, we have just been seeing, so to say. <laughs> so, um, yes, that's actually a very good question. And uh, again, the answer, um, we don't know, because common cold viruses have not been studied much because they were never really a big problem. People get sick, kids get sick, you get over it. So we don't even know if the T-cell targets, uh, what the T-cell targets against the common cold viruses are. So it remains to be seen if uh, we see less common cold if we have a successful SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. But it's a very good uh, thinking. Great, yeah, I agree. Okay, here's one for me. How long might a vaccine protect us? Um, this is a very uh, relevant, poignant question. Uh, a related issue is if you're infected, can you be reinfected? Let me start with that. And there are some, a few cases, very few, but there are a few known cases of people who apparently were infected, I think one in Nevada and one in Hong Kong, uh, who apparently were reinfected. You have to realize the, um, the immune system of individuals is highly different. So um, those few cases don't really tell us very much. So for cold viruses, uh, it does appear that immunity wanes after a while. And uh, I'm not particularly optimistic that a vaccine, one shot or two shots as they anticipate, uh, will give us complete protection uh, for 10 years or more. Uh, it's possible that we may need to get, um, and when I say complete protection, I mean literally give, a, give herd immunity. Okay, wipe out the disease. The disease can't spread because everybody has so much protection that it's done. But that doesn't mean that uh, the vac a vaccine won't lessen symptoms and lessen spread very, very significantly for some time. Whether we'll, uh, we'll need it to get a, a, a revaccination every two years or at some interval, we really don't have enough data because, because this infection is so new. The other thing we could look at is the, you know, the respiratory SARS virus from 2003 in China that broke out. Uh, and that may also give us some insight. But um, uh, one thing that is on the positive side uh, that I'm seeing is that the virus um, while it does mutate and evolve, and some of the work from the Sapphire Lab and others has shown that, um, the virus doesn't change as quickly as influenza or as HIV, so that you're confronted with kind of a completely new entity uh, very, very rapidly. It seems to be, have a little more uh, regularity, if you will, in its replication, so it doesn't change quite as rapidly. So that also gives me hope that vaccines will give us uh, uh, some protection, perhaps multi-year protection, but I don't think, uh, I'm not so optimistic about looking at something that might be decade long. Okay, all right. Um, so let's see what we have here. Okay, for Steve, which online publications might a person go to for to find published trials, uh, results, and studies? Ah. Well, right now, it's a deep dive if you really want to get into the data. So for clinical trials, uh, there is a, a degree of confidentiality. Uh, normally, it's extremely confidential, and there's a revealing of results only at the end. The idea is uh, both uh, um, confidentiality uh, for the sponsor, but also to avoid speculation and bias. These are different times. Uh, we're actually getting... Uh, insights into uh, trial activity uh, midstream. Um, there was reporting today about some adverse events, and um, uh, those are being in investigated. The uh, online community, though, uh, during this, this pandemic in particular, has, has embraced a site called BioArchive, and it's a preprint site where 
um, investigators who are submitting uh, their results for peer review, which by the way can be heartbreaking because it, it's reviewed by your competitors and highly, hopefully highly um, critical editorial staff. Um, but there's been a, an awful lot published. And so if you wanna get into the nitty gritty and some of the technical uh, details, uh, BioArchive is a great, great spot. Okay, well, I want to thank uh, Daniela first, Daniela Weisskopf, um, for taking time to join us on this presentation, live from the lab, also Steve Wilson, and the audience. You've been a great audience. You've really hung in there through the entire presentation. Um, and I'd like to close, and uh, let's go to the final uh, information slide. And Steve, I think uh, you had a few more remarks. Yeah, I just want to stress that, um, you know, you can see from uh, where Daniela is standing that the Institute remains um, extremely busy. And um, the generosity to date has been uh, just tremendous, but we're very ambitious. And we think that um, building a community of, of researchers as we've done to deal with COVID-19 is gonna to continue to pay dividends in planning in the future. So if, you, if this is one of your uh, first introductions to the Institute, uh, please get to know us a lot better. Uh, we have a website that talks about some of our programs and COVID in particular. And if you're thinking about uh, charitable causes and ways to really you know, help uh, move forward science and the study of the immune system, um, of course, I'm biased, but I, I feel that the La Jolla Institute uh, really is, is in, a, is in a, a, a unique place and somewhere where your gift can do an awful lot for many different diseases. I think uh, in closing, uh, we're going to leave this slide up so that you can take down the information. But I do in, invite all of you to get in touch with us and to make sure that uh, we're able to get back, either uh, those of us who are presenting or, or others, we'll get back with any questions we didn't cover. And then of course, um, uh, when we're able, we'd love to have you in for a visit to actually see how the Institute uh, operates. Um, sooner the better. So with that. And one, one last word, Steve. Everybody, stay healthy, wear a mask, take precautions. It's. Um, this is an unpredictable infection. So please, please be careful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.